Thanks for checking out this movie review video. This is for the 1997 Giallo film Crazy Desires of a Murderer. And this is part of one of those Vinegar Syndrome Forgotten Gialli uh, box sets, which I also did a review, I think now two weekends ago, for Autopsy, which was also in the same box set. Um, they dumped on Shudder all, f like, the first four box sets that Vinegar Syndrome did are Forgotten Gialli, so if you want to see those, they're on Shudder, including Crazy Desires of a Murderer. Uh, disclaimer real quick, still have some After Effects lingering from covid so anything like clearing my throat or coughing, I will turn away from the microphone over here. Uh, apologies and might need to drink some water. But let's get into Crazy Desires of a Murderer, which was a decent, decently fun ride in my opinion. Uh, directed by Filippo Walter Rutti, uh, who also did Lost Happiness, The Black Mask, Operation White Shark, that sounds fun, and Night of the Damned. Written by Ambrosio Molteni, uh, who also wrote Enter the Devil, Black Emmanuel 2, Yellow Emmanuel, Sister Emmanuel, and Violence in a Woman's Prison. Just a good representation of what this individual was primarily writing, what type of genre there you can surmise from all that. So getting into the film, the sequence in the beginning with the person walking up the stairs as their shadow gets larger and larger Super cool visual. Also, the fact that they don't really have much music playing at that point, so you can really focus on the sound design was really cool. I really enjoy that aspect of it. But yeah, that visual of like the shadow just getting larger and larger and larger as they go up the stairs and the lights kind of shining downward. Super cool. Love that visual. And there's, you know, there's decent directing, decent cinematography going on here. For like a forgotten Gialli film, I mean... Pretty, pretty entertaining. I think it's worth watching. I also dig the lack of music for most of it because the sound of the person slowly walking is kind of creepy. That's another thing. That focus on sound design gets to this kind of creepy moment where you're just solely focused on how slowly this person's walking. And you're also seeing that their hands are covered in blood. Now, obviously, later, because of where they came from, you're going to assume this was Leandro, the you know, has been to a mental institution, we think, uh, son of the Baron, who, I guess, witnessed his mother die, and also stabbed the gardener who his mother was having sex with. Convoluted. It, it's like most giallo, convoluted story, but we'll talk more about that. Ileana's father, the Baron, was just assumed to be killed, along with someone else, and Pierluigi is being taken hostage as soon as we meet him. Uh, the film hits the ground running with all this stuff. Like, you think, because it's the, the phone call between Ileana and the Baron is interrupted, you think that he just got killed. He did not, but you think he did, and you're all already like, that's crazy, we already saw someone who was walking slowly with their hands covered in blood, they probably killed someone. And then we get to Pierluigi being abducted, but that's that whole situation is a setup to kind of show you that he's involved in shady dealings. Then we end up finding out that Bobby is also involved in these shady dealings with him. And so that is meant to make them, both of them, Bobby and Pierluigi, um, red herrings within the film. And they do a pretty solid job of throwing a lot of red herrings at you. And I'll talk more about those as I continue this review. When Ileana and her friends, I, I question why, whether they're her actual friends because all of them are kind of, you know, talking about her being kind of a easy mark, at least Bobby and Pierluigi were. But when Ileana and her friends make it to her home, Hans is standing behind a metal gate with blood on it. Notice that. Is this hinting that he's involved? I believe that it was hinting that he was involved. And in the end, it turns out, yes, he was involved because obviously it was... Berta, um, it's Berta, Hans, kind of Leandro, uh, but there is that little sequence with him and Olsen, the doctor, who Olsen was kind of calling himself Uncle Wolf and kind of insinuating, you know, who was really doing the killing was him, uh, but yeah, like, messy, but yeah, uh, but I do think that, like, him standing behind that gate and you could actually see blood on the gate... I think that insinuates that he has some involvement because he knows about the blood. Or it's just a common occurrence that Leandro is doing his taxidermy. He always has, you know, blood on his hands from that. And he goes around and touches things. And Hans, even though it might be his job, just does not wipe this down. He's just like, eh, hey, whatever. 
The Baron being said to be an expert on Oriental art leads me to believe that some aspect of this, or this aspect of his life, will end up playing a role in the murder motivation, but it doesn't. That's kind of a weird twist to me, because why would they throw that in there and make it such a big focus and not bring it back? I don't know. It's just kind of a kind of an odd thing, in my opinion. Obviously, the Baron has severe memory issues since he doesn't remember that Frank's father died and that he even gave the eulogy at the funeral. Uh, this kind of sets it up to have him not be reliable when it comes to him actually experiencing or seeing the murderer. Like, when the inspector shows up, he's sure that the Baron saw the murderer. And so he uh, is re unreliable. The audience already knows he has memory issues, so he's probably not going to be that helpful. He's not going to be able to say who did it. So that can't, comes into play in a good way. I guess Pierre, Luigi, and Bobby aren't real good friends of Ileana since they used her to mule drugs. And they talk about that, and they even talk about, hey, you know, we'll find some other broad after this because there are plenty of attractive women who we can use to unknowingly mule drugs for us, because that's the impression you get is she didn't know that that was going on. She's clean. She's a good person. Kind of an odd mention about the surgeon who almost hits Frank with his car, Olsen. Uh, it does cast suspicion that he'll end up becoming important later, which obviously he does, because the, there's the insinuation, like I said, when Olsen's talking to Leandra towards the end, insinuating that he is the person actually doing the killing, where Berta and Hans believe it is Leandra doing the killing, and then they swoop in and they basically just loot the bodies. So, yeah. Um, so that hit me as, as interesting that they made that a thing. And he's mentioned again, which I'll, I'll bring it up when it in chronological order when it was mentioned again, but it put him in my mind. I'm like, suspicious. The basement in this place is ridiculously creepy, so much so that you would think that Gretel when she's scared by Leandro, would run up the stairs and not further into this super creepy basement. <laughs> that just seemed like a really counterintuitive thing. Like, she doesn't even know where she's going. And then she gets scared again because she runs into Hans. And he's just a creepy dude in the first place. But you would think, because she had already been upstairs and it seemed like a safe place, she would have just taken a off back up the stairs. Because Leandro wasn't, like, blocking the stairs or anything. I don't know. Just, you know. A thing. Leandro doing taxidermy is supposed to make him seem capable of murder. Uh, he also acts very creepy and doesn't speak. So that's super, super red herring going on there. I think they did a good job of making him look like a very good suspect to the audience. But, as we find out, he probably wasn't involved at all. Like, he was just still doing his taxidermy thing, even though Hans and Berta were of the opinion that he was doing it doing the killing, but we find out, you know, Olsen did it, so. Berta the maid is sleeping with Re Leandro, I suppose, and we know she also had something going on with Frank based on the quick conversation that she has with Frank. So it is established that Berta is boning multiple people very, very early. There's a talk between her and Frank that insinuates there was something going on there. We see her seducing Leandro, and then later on we see her ha having sex with Hans, even though both, I think both of them, no, I think Hans, Hans denies having a sexual relationship with her. She does not to the inspector, but she's sleeping around. I mean, hey, free love, go for it. A lot of people having sex on this, by the way. Very, very focused on sex, which I'm not that surprised because with the title like Crazy, Desire, uh, Crazy Desires of a Murderer, the desires portion insinuates like a sexual element. Just saying. They play an interesting version of charades, uh, Ileana and her friends. I'm not sure how anyone actually guessed what the films were during these charades. It seemed more like just an excuse for people to just bone in front of each other. This is kind of that whole, like, exhibitionist voyeur thing kind of coming into play. Uh, also, just obviously getting nudity into the film and sex scenes into the film. Um, they're very comfortable with one another, That that's for sure. Free loving. I mean, it was the 70s. Go for it. I like Frank's logic of having sex with Gretel in front of everyone because he couldn't choose Elsa so that their relationship could remain a secret. Uh, although it is also very easy to see why Elsa was very upset with this and she didn't buy this as a legitimate uh, excuse for him having sex right in front of her 
with Gretel. Uh, I mean, the fact that he tries to sell it as like, it's the only way that I could have kept our relationship uh, from be, you know coming out into the open because obviously we need to keep it this secret. And you never really find out why so much. It's just very weird. But hey, uh, funny moment. I laughed at that one. Is everyone having sex? Because Bobby and Ileana do, and then Pierluigi and Elsa do, and then we've seen Berta and Leandra having sex. We see Berta and Hans having sex. It's just like bone, 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 bone. Lots of boning. Lots of boning in this. This is one of those giallos that goes hard for it. Not quite as much as something like Slaughter Hotel, but pretty hard at the uh, nudity and sex. Note that Elsa seems let down after she uh, has sex with Pierluigi. Notice that. Like, the look on her face when they're both laying in bed with their cigarettes. Like, she just looked, like, bored, unimpressed, let down. But then I, I'm wondering what was what they were hinting at happening after that because he goes over that candle and he's just, like, rubbing it like he's stroking it and it's, like, smoothing it down to make it look more penis-like. And then she turns over. So I wonder if that was going in the back door. I mean, that's what I took from it. If you have another theory, let me know. Don't know. I like how Zelda... Why did I... Why does it say Zelda? Oh, my gosh. I like how Elsa just accepts death. She gets stabbed once and then she just lays back to die. That was a weird death scene because literally she sits up, she gets stabbed once, and then she literally just like peacefully is just kind of like, uh, no fighting, no trying to get away, no trying to like get help, nothing. She's just like, oh, got stabbed, I'm done, bye. So that was kind of a weird, weird scene. But the shot of Elsa's eye being taken out with the knife, pretty gnarly. That looked pretty good. For the 70s practical effects, that looked pretty good. Like I said, it looked gnarly. Uh, could make some people pretty squeamish, especially people who have issues with eyeball things in horror films or just eyeball things in general. Um, it looked good. I appreciated that. Of course, the inspector brings up the possibility of a sex maniac. This makes it a typical giallo film because almost every giallo film has mentioned at one point or another or of, you know, the killer could be a sex maniac or we know for a fact that it's a sex maniac. And you would think that that may have been at play here because of the title of the film, the whole desires thing, but it's not, which in a way, I guess the title is actually a bit of a red herring itself. Although, you know, there is desire at the root of certain things like a desire to kill and a desire for Hans and Berta to actually, you know, get rich with the stuff that they're stealing. Although it kind of looked like from the perspective of Berta, maybe she wasn't selling stuff because she kept the necklace from Elsa and was actually wearing it. So I don't know. This might, this might be the most intelligent inspector I've ever seen in a Giallo film. He does an excellent job with the interrogating. He's in the film for a decent amount of time. He sticks with it. He comes up with that amazing plan of like baiting the killer with who, well, you think he's baiting the killer with Gretel, but then he's actually baiting the killer with himself dressed up as and in the um, wheelchair of the Baron because he secretly knows and doesn't tell anyone that he would, the person would go after the Baron instead. So definitely the most intelligent I've seen in a while. Maybe the most intel intelligent inspector I've seen in a Giallo ever. Because the overwhelming majority of the times in Giallo films, the inspectors are pretty useless. Like, police in Giallo films are typically like bumbling idiots. So it was very surprising to see this. And I liked the character. I thought the inspector was cool. Did a great job. Also, <clears throat> excuse me. I should actually get some horror hydration going. Mm. Throat got too dry. Olsen, the doc doctor, ends up coming up again when the inspector talks to Frank about his role in embalming the Baroness. This, again, seemed a little weird to me that they'd be bringing him up, and he was kind of like a late character that was really being introduced into the film, and I was kind of like, this has got to be... There's got to be something important with this doctor. He can't, he can't just be, like, randomly showing up if they've mentioned him twice now, and then he's showing up as, like, an actual character and having somewhat of a role in the film. So, was catching on to that stuff. I, and, you know, as a note, I've said this before, 
when I'm doing, when I'm watching films for doing reviews, I'm watching them in a very different way than if I'm just like relaxing and not taking notes and not planning on doing a review. So I'm super attentive. Uh, can't Pierre Luigi wait until he knows the inspector is gone before confronting Bobby about the missing drugs? Because as you see, the inspector then is listening through the door, then he knows what there's something going on between them, and then in the end, not only does he end up solving the crime, the main case at hand, but he also picks up on the fact that Bobby and Pierre Luigi are drug dealers, or at least drug smugglers, and then he ends up being able somehow to tie them to those charred bodies in the car that they killed and then pushed over a cliff. Which, that seemed like a scene that like didn't even need to happen. It was kind of like an out-of-nowhere type thing. Then we see that drug smuggling apparently isn't enough for Pierre Luigi, and he's going to start grave robbing. He's thinking and thinking and thinking about this giant emerald that was buried with the Baroness, so then he goes and he's trying to like crowbar open her tomb, or her casket, uh, and then they think that he stole it, but I but believe in the end it was actually Berta and Hans who stole it, and it was probably pawned already, well not pawned, but like sold, because I'm Pawning wasn't a thing back then, but maybe it was. I don't know. Pierre Luigi and his money troubles just seem like a lazy distraction. They do. And that's, I, I wrote that as a note when he was having his whole meeting with the guys where it goes wrong and then he kills them and then, you know, puts them in the car and sends it off the cliff. Like, it seemed, it seemed like distraction. I was like, they're going too hard at this. He's a red herring. Like, there's no way. Same with Bobby because he's tied up in this as well. Ended up being correct. Uh, so Leandro killed the gardener? I thought what was explained is that someone killed the Baroness, but the gardener was still alive. But then we see in these flashbacks, which they only do two flashbacks. It's kind of odd. I figured they would do more for Leandro. But they do these flashbacks, and they do them in black and white, which I think is a good idea because that like visually signals to you this is not present time because everything in present time is color so this is obviously another time this is in the past so they show that he actually killed the gardener because he walks in on the baroness his mother having sex with the gardener and then he just grabs the the closest sharp thing is just like eh. and i guess that's to insinuate where he gets this love of like dissecting things and stabbing and cutting things up just thinking so the eyes Leandro has in his cabinet were his mother's? I don't understand. At first I thought they were his mother's, but then I was like, oh, maybe they're Elsa's because then there was this, I think it was the inspector made a comment that the real killer could have actually snuck in knowing where Leandro was living and put the eyes in that cabinet instead. I don't know. But Leandro doesn't seem to act like he didn't know the eyes were there, so it, I, I don't know. Uh, I guess it was probably Elsa's eyes. Someone let me know in the comments. I like how the inspector wants to use Gretel as bait, but he keeps telling her not to worry at all. <laughs> I mean, from his perspective, it was probably because of the fact that he knows that the killer's going to go after the Baron, and he, he's actually going to be the real bait. But he does need everyone else to believe that Gretel is the legitimate bait, but it's just, it doesn't work for someone in a situation like that to just be like, don't worry about anything. You know, we're going to set you up as bait. There's someone very dangerous coming after you. But just, you know, just don't worry about it. We got everything handled. Even with the police there, I would be super worried. Just saying. And you do see Gretel getting worried because they, they have like some shots of her and she's just like profusely sweating. I'm pretty sure that was why they were doing that. It's to be like, she's worried. Uh, as soon as Berta took the tea to Gretel, I figured she was involved somehow because it's then indicating you how easily she can kind of move around the place because she's expected to be doing that. Uh, and then you have the situation where she goes back to her room, she gets butt naked, and you see Elsa's necklace on her. And then you know in some way she is involved. And then that's when you find out she and Hans in cahoots to you know, rob the bodies after they were killed by who they think is Leandro, but it seems to actually be Dr. Olson, Uncle Wolf. Gotta get in one last sex scene. <laughs> the sex that goes on between Berta and Hans very late in the film, it, that's how it just felt to me. I'm just like, oh, they felt like, 
oh, it's been a little bit since we had a sex scene. We better, we are jam one last sex scene in here. Let's go for it. Okay, whatever. I see that. Uh, solid twist that Leandro, that you believe Leandro is doing the killing and that Berton Hans are looting the bodies. I like that as a twist. I thought it worked pretty well. But then it seems like it ends up pointing to Olsen as the actual killer until he gets knifed and thrown off the cliff because he's just walking outside by himself. You don't do that in giallo films or horror films in general. You just don't do that. Gets knifed, thrown off the cliff. Which, by the way, him getting thrown off the cliff just looked funny. I appreciate how funny it looked. It's just kind of like like in giallo films when people get like thrown down something and they show like the body go all the way down and it just looks so full on like a dummy. You didn't get that here. I was hoping for it, but you do get a quick glimpse of something that doesn't look too great. But I love that. Love that about giallos. Um, the death of Hans is a pretty good one where he gets his throat slit and then he's being stabbed. Lots of gore, lots of blood. I appreciate that quite a bit. It looked good. And then I believe they then show the eyes. So those were those were taken care of. That's a that's a calling card of the killer in this one is taking out those eyes. Based on how they shot it and the clothing used, it actually at the end looked like Frank would end up being the killer, but it's Berta. I thought that was a really good kind of misdirect because based off how they kind of made the hair look in the dark and the clothing that Berta was wearing, it really made me think it was going to end up being Frank because it looked like Frank when he was walking. And, you know, maybe it's a situation where they actually used Frank for those scenes and then once it's revealed who it is, it's just like, boom, it's Berta in those clothes instead. That's what I'm assuming happened. But uh, really good misdirect there. I did enjoy that. And then the inspector solves the case and catches Bobby and Pierre Luigi in the process. I just put down stunning. I was gobsmacked. I was so surprised that the inspector did so well. Because like I said, law enforcement in Giallo films are typically very stupid. So uh, yeah, he was a great character. I really did enjoy the inspector. Very, very cool. And overall, this was a pretty solid Giallo. It's not the best. Uh, got a bit slow. Well, more than a bit slow. It got pretty slow in there. Seemed like it was very, very focused on the sexual element. But, you know, you're going to get that with Giallo films because that's actually a calling card of Giallo films. Makes sense. But uh, out of five stars with half stars in play, I'm going to give it three stars. I think that's solid enough. It's decent. It is a, probably an underrated uh, giallo film because most people probably haven't seen it but i would recommend people checking it out um and telling people who are into giallo to check it out because like i said it's on shutter when i'm doing this review but anyway thank you for checking this out please put some comments down here if you want to talk about this film or giallo in general do me a big favor hit subscribe to my channel it is quick painless cost you nothing and i greatly appreciate it also hit the notification bell button because then you'll know when i'm putting up new videos which I'm doing at least for a week at this point, which I think is a good amount, so repay me. Help me out here. Regardless, though, thanks for checking out this video, and until next time, keep it brutal.